because I had no patience, tolerance, and love for myself when I got here. Mm. I thought I was the biggest jerk in the world when I looked at the mirror. And that was hard. That took a lot. And I, I, I tell newcomers, I don't ever want to repeat year one over. The highs were high, but the lows were low, man. I don't want to go there. Mm. In step two, it talks to, about coming to will be restored to sanity. I was completely insane for drinking. All I wanted to do was drink. I took two weeks my freshman year as a pre-med student and just drank every single day. And, and I knew from the beginning I had a problem. And now that I'm practicing these steps and even the traditions that allow us to work together and to take a reduced status, where else is that appreciated other than AA? Welcome to the Daily Reflection Podcast with your hosts, Michael L. and Lee M. On this podcast, we try to bring inspiration through interviews with members of the recovery community. We are not aligned with any 12-step or recovery program, but you will hear them mentioned throughout the course of an interview. Today on the show, Jim D. from Lake George, New York, sharing on the concept of a unique stability. I hope you enjoy this episode. Good morning, Lee. How are you? I'm doing great this morning. How are you doing, Mike? Oh, never better. It's great to see you again. Hey, what's on tap for today? Well, today is February 27th, and we have with us Jim D. from Lake George, New York, and I'm very excited to hear him share about a unique stability. Well, Jim, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lee. We get started in the same way every day. We ask the guests to read the Daily Reflection for us. Do you have it handy? Yes, I do. February 27th, a unique stability. Where does AA get its direction? These practical folk then read Tradition 2 and learn that the sole authority in AA is a loving God as he may express himself in the group conscience. The elder statesman is the one who sees the wisdom of the group's decision, who holds no resentment over his reduced status, whose judgment, fortified by considerable experience, is sound, and who is willing to sit quietly on the sidelines, patiently awaiting development. Twelve Steps and Twelve Traditions, pages 132 and 135. Into the fabric of recovery from alcoholism are woven the 12 steps and 12 traditions. As my recovery progressed, I realized that the new mantle was tailor-made for me. The elders of the group gently offered suggestions when change seemed impossible. Everyone's shared experiences became the substance for treasured friendships. I know that the fellowship is ready and equipped to aid each suffering alcoholic at all crossroads in life. In a world beset by many problems, I find this assurance a unique stability. I cherish the gift of sobriety. I offer God my gratitude for the strength I receive in a fellowship that truly exists for the good of all members. Wow. So what do you think the author is talking about stability? Well, stability for me is being able to look at myself in the mirror. The decisions that I make as a result of practicing the principles of this program make it possible for me to look at myself in the mirror with love as opposed to complete and utter disdain, which it was before I got sober. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like before? What it was like before, it was, I thought that alcohol was the solution. It made me uh, a better conversationalist. I was the life of the party because I was the one who had a connection to get booze for the 15 to 17 year old crowd in high school i was the man but as i got older it turned on me when i went away to college and didn't have the responsibilities of being the oldest of four children i went crazy and that's when i discovered uh, in step two it talks to about coming to will be restored to sanity i was completely insane for drinking all i wanted to do was drink i took two weeks my freshman year didn't go to biology class or any other for that matter as a pre-med student and just drank every single day. And, and I knew from the beginning I had a problem. And now that I'm practicing these steps and even the traditions that allow us to work together and to take a reduced status, where else is that appreciated other than AA? Um, I, I can fit in with that because it works for me. We're all in this together. So Jim, did you get sober at about college age, or how old were you I, when you got sober? Well, I was 25 years old, but I was still acting like a 12-year-old, which is when I started drinking and drugging, and I was a blackout dr drinker from the beginning. My college graduated friends, one of them actually said to me before I got sober, we will leave you behind. 
And I'm grateful that he said that. I remembered it. And I'm glad that he said that to me because I was letting life go in the wrong direction. And how did you find your way into the rooms at the age of 25? My younger brother, John, who had a problem with alcohol and some dry goods uh, that accelerated his bottom, uh, went into rehab. I'm trying to think how many years before me, probably five. And my brother and I went to the outpatient family treatment. Uh, he was five years younger than me. And then on our way home, we would imbibe and carry on like uh, drunken idiots. And we thought it was funny, but a seed was planted. So that when I hit my bottom at age 25, when I thought getting on a bus from New York City to go to Tallahassee, Florida to be a bum would be a good idea. Uh, that was the absolute insanity of alcoholism for me because I was giving up my wife, my job, my good family that supported me so that I could drink. And it wasn't working in the beginning. So this Daily Reflection is talking about traditions, Tradition 2 specifically. And before we get to the traditions, how long did it take you to get through the steps? I think by the end of the first year, I had completed the 12 steps. You know, I'm a little foggy on the actual timing, but I went through an intensive outpatient program. And, you know, I remember things vividly, although not exactly when I hit them, but like doing the fourth step. And I had a great counselor who was an AA member. He looked and sounded like Morgan Freeman, which was a home run for me because I was an electric company kid when I grew up. And that was just, it couldn't have been a better choice. Um, so, you know, I got through those steps in that first year and got involved in coffee commitments and service and started to learn about the traditions as well. Yeah. And the second tradition is about um, group conscience and how it expresses itself through, uh, through the group. Talk a little bit about what that means to you in, in your program of recovery. What does tradition two mean to you? Mission two means to me that God's going to listen to all of us. Normally, a group conscience is a business meeting, and that can get messy. But one of the principles that I learned about group consciences and other AA service levels was that the minority opinion has to be heard. And normally, uh, if I didn't like what you had to say, I don't want to hear it. But I had to learn a new concept in an AA, in AA to listen to the minority opinion. And sometimes it didn't always sway me, but one of the problems I've had in my life is that I felt like I wasn't heard. I did a lot. I was, I was appreciated, but I wasn't really heard. Just do what I ask you to do. I don't want, don't talk to me. Don't tell me, you know, just do it. That this was good to be, to have a place where I was heard and we all work on this together. But tell me a little bit about um, the group structure where you're at and and what it means to get in service for you. Well, the group that I was part of back in New Jersey, where I was part of the group conscience, it's the most experience I had. Uh, it was great. We worked together to make sure everyone had a voice. Every year they do the group inventory or they ask questions at one of the service levels and we weren't going to limit the entire time of the meeting, but we did limit people to how much time they had to share to two minutes. We all agreed on it and we all supported it, but it didn't have to stop at one round. We would go around and around until people were tired of talking or people were tired of listening and they were ready to vote. And that really helped me to work through that process. Service has always been important to me because my sponsor got me into the coffee commitment back in 1989 when I got sober. There were ashtrays and I wasn't a smoker. And he was like, I want you to clean the ashtrays because you are not going to get any benefit from that. You're just going to do it as a service for your fellow AA members and you will benefit in the end. But you're not getting an immediate benefit. And that was a great lesson. So what do you tell the newcomer? I love to work with newcomers. I I remember walking into my first AA meeting confused, upset, nervous, and all I got from people when I walked in was a warm smile, a firm handshake, maybe a clap on the shoulder. I felt at home. And when I heard people share what they did, it was even better. But 
things were tough. You know, my wife and I were on the rocks, but still couldn't afford to not live together. We were sleeping on opposite sides of a full bed. You could probably fit three people between us at that time. It was rough. Uh, my dad was mad because I was not a good husband. I left my wife to go to Florida. Who does that? He never did that. You know, what's the matter with you, Jimmy? And, you know, work, of course, said, oh, you admitted you're an alcoholic. Great. You got one shot. You screw up, you're gone. And so I was on thin ice uh, with a lot of people, but not in AA. It was nice and warm. And I, I jumped right in and appreciated it. And I try to offer that to newcomers to help them. I, back in the 80s, 89, there was some tough talk. You know, sit down, shut up, take the cotton out of your ears and stick it in your mouth. And uh, I gravitated more towards the folks who said, sit back relax and listen. And that helped me a lot because I did. I didn't remember what I listened to. I had to listen to it over and over. And that was important. I needed to do that. It's interesting because in the daily reflection here, it says that the elders of the group gently offered suggestions when change seemed impossible and everyone's shared experience became the substance for treasured friendships. And I'm wondering as a young man who probably thought he knew everything, what was that like? Let's to the suggestions of those who went before you? It was great because they were, they made sense. Uh, well, sometimes they didn't. After a meeting one night, a man uh, said to me, stick around, kid. You're going to get a chance to live your life. And I looked at him like, what's that all about? He said, well, I've got three ex-wives and six kids that hate my guts because of my drinking. And that's not the kind of life that I want to live. And so I'm telling you, if you stick with this program, you won't have to live my life. It's not horrible now, he said, but, you know, there are days because I've got all those people who are having a hard time putting away the past. And that helped me a lot. And it was the, the gentle talkers who helped me. That counselor, he took me out to a diner and we sat down and had coffee. And he said, this is what you're going to be doing in AA. And I said, what? I thought I was going to meetings. He said, no, 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 that's not all there. You're going to go out after the meeting and you're going to sit down at a table and have coffee with someone who's got more experience, hopefully your sponsor, and um, they're going to help you because you need, uh, to him, a sponsor was God with skin on him. And I thought that was awesome. I often share in meetings when that comes up that you know, if God actually spoke to me, like through these headphones right now, I'd probably wet myself because I wouldn't know what to do if I heard the voice of God, you know, for real. Um, but to hear it man to man or, or woman to man, you know, I've, I've heard so many things I identify with in meetings that are just God inspired. So it's funny you mentioned that. That was on a recent daily reflection. And one of the concepts was that, look, if, if I'm in meetings and I hear the voice of God, then God must be speaking through me. Do you think God speaks through you as well? Absolutely. Especially when I'm not, I'm not thinking. My best example of that was a, a man who I admired his sobriety. He was coming up behind me. He had a lot of vigor and love for the program, but he hated the word God. And in a meeting, it was probably, I don't know, it was on the third step, I believe. And it was God, 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 God. And the, he was the first one to raise his hand and share. And he was angry. I hate that word. I don't want to hear it. I don't like God. And I don't know where it came from. But the solution was maybe some literature that I said, George, the big book is a big book because paper, big paper, fat, thick, large pages was cheaper back in the 30s when the big book was made. And God is a three letter word that is less ink to put on the page. They're not going to say as you understand him over and over and over again, that's too expensive. And that came, that was a gift from God because that I, I don't, I'm not that good. <laughs> and it worked. He, he's never forgotten that. What do you think about, so we're talking about, you know, the concept of God showing up in, in the group. In other words, the group is stronger than the individual. We're all just a part of the group. Um, how does this translate in, into your marriage and into your family life? today? Fortunately for me, my family of origin where I grew up, it was all about we're 
we're all in the same boat. It was teamwork. Four kids, two parents. When mom and dad came home with groceries, they beeped the horn and it was all hands on deck. We all get the food in. We ate sandwiches that we made from loaves of Italian bread, split them down the middle, put butter on them, put your meat and cheese and whatever you wanted, cut it up into five segments and boom, in the freezer they go for the week. So my family helped me with that teamwork thing. So it was like being home to have everybody pull together. I, I like when, unfortunately, we had a situation where there was a gentleman who was drunk and he was trying to harass women and he had to be physically removed from the meeting. But the bottom line was we protect the whole group, the women, the men. We don't mind someone being drunk, but if they're drunk and they're bothering people, that's not good. And that's the conscience of this group. And that was important. Well, Jim, is there anything else you'd like to tell the audience before we wrap up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, keep coming. And it's came to believe just because you don't believe right now doesn't mean you never will. And you might believe in a way you never thought you would. Well, I thanks very that. much, Jim. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. Oh, great to be on here. You guys <laughs> made it easy. It's, you know, and it's been wonderful. Thanks to Jim for stopping by. And thanks to you, the listeners. If you want to find us online, join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash Daily Reflection Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Daily Reflector. You can read about recovery on our blog at blog.dailyreflectionpodcast.com. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, we'd love if you were to give us a rating, give us a comment, give us some feedback. Let us know what you think of the podcast. We'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.